Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Happy Mum, Happy Baby, the podcast. Today's guests, there are two of them, have sat alongside each other on the sofa for years. And I don't mean in a sense of sat alongside each other watching Bridgerton or The Crown or anything like that. They've actually been on our screens. I have TV royalty with me today. Not only that, they have a hugely successful book club, which as an author, I have to say, it's the book club that everyone wants to be a part of. Um, I haven't been, but I love you. It's okay, I forgive you. Um, <laughs> they also have raised together four children and are now grandparents. Today's guest, if you haven't guessed already, it's Richard and Judy. Hello. Hi. Hello. How are you both? We're very well. I mean, sort of, it's a weird time, isn't it, at the moment? It's kind of in between everything. It, it, I'm not really expecting any of us to kind of... Uh, do anything much before Easter and it still seems such a long way away the spring doesn't it it's a battle yeah. it's a battle getting through this kind of weather and this kind of crisis but we seem to be kind of getting there with the vaccines and stuff so. yeah it's mm. it's much worse than the first lockdown isn't it I mean in the, I mean the first lockdown we were just blessed with amazing weather across yeah. most of the country it was incredible you know sitting out in the garden sipping wine it was you, know, you thought this this is punishment you know it's, this is a pandemic I mean Fine, we can tell like. that your children have left home just in those <laughs> few sentences there sat in the garden drinking wine oh, <laughs> absolutely what, what absolutely. time is wine o'clock for you then what time do you allow yourself to uh, about half past seven. Oh, okay all which right. is okay but then that's when we start our work yeah of course uh, because you're yeah. you're with the kids all day and then you yeah. work in the evening it, mm -hmm. and so you, you you must get very tired then i mean it must be full on for you all day and all evening yeah, it is. It is. It's quite intense. But then I think there comes a point at 11 o'clock where we're both like, we have to stop. So we sit down and we've just started watching This Is Us, which basically means that we cry for an hour and then go to bed. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? Because of lockdown, this has become the staple of conversation between all of us, hasn't it? You know, strangers, family, we're all contacting each other. So have you watched this? Have you watched that? Because that's all there is to bloody do. That's um, what we're doing. I mean, our, our favourite was, um, you must have seen It's a Sin. No, I haven't no. yet. I haven't seen oh that yet. Oh, my no. God, you've got to see that. It's the best thing on television in years, isn't it? It, it, was, it was absolutely brilliant, actually. I think it's still going, actually, but we binged and sort of watched a whole lot in one go. It really is it's very, amazing. very good. It's fantastic. But listen, what I, no, I mean, I have to say, obviously, we're lucky in, in lockdown and we sit here moaning that we've got nothing to do. But we, the fact that we haven't got young children at home who, aren't, who don't need uh, homeschooling and uh, don't need any attention means that yeah we get a bit bored and fed up but it's 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 sort of easy for us apart from the general anxiety um but I do wonder if this I mean I know that it must be really hard to keep four kids or two kids or even one kid um incredibly uh occupied, occupied and interested and happy during the day without school but I wonder if everybody's worrying too much about the the long-term effects of them being off school. You know, I mean, mm. I don't think... Our grandchildren, our oldest granddaughter is uh, eight now, and I know she's... Uh, and uh, we, we've got a, a three-year-old granddaughter and a two-year-old grandson, so the, the two littlest ones don't really count. But the oldest one, Ivy, I mean, I think she's really happy at home. I mean, she misses her friends, but I think she's happy, and I don't sort of see this period of doing her any long-term harm. I think there's a bit too much pessimism about it. Do you? I, I completely agree. I feel like my kids are super happy. And I, and I don't know whether that's because they've got each other. I mean, there have been times where they've just argued for weeks on end. And, and at the moment, they're in a beautiful phase where they are playing together. They're sleeping in the same room because they want to. Um, and it does feel like they've kind of turned a corner. And also, I don't know whether that's a year in and they've grown up a little bit and they've adapted. But they don't really talk about their friends that much. Not, not in, in terms of like, oh, I wish I could play with them. You know, so I, I do feel I feel like they are happy. Um, and I think this I think the reason why this lockdown is a bit harder is because first lockdown, you had this thing of, you know, what a what a blessing to have this amount of time. We're in a global pandemic. The world has kind of stopped. Let's enjoy this time with our children. And now the pressures of work are there like you can only hold off things for so long you know we're all like dams kind of trying to keep it back yeah but i completely um, i completely agree with, with both of you and, and a lot of people that i know are thinking the same way the, the kind of the default position about kids being at home and not going to school is that it's doing them terrible harm and the longer it goes on the more damage it's going to do I, i'm not i'm not underplaying it I'm, I'm not saying that there aren't problems and i certainly sympathize with, with with parents who are at their wits end you know having a home school and all that so I'm, I'm i'm not you know in denial about it but all i can say is on a much kind of broader level that 
kids, in our experience and in, in, in humankind's experience, are incredibly adaptable. Mm. I mean, if you just think about what, if you just think back to your own childhood and remember the shock, I remember it, of the first day at school. I remember going to school, an infant school, when I was, what, five? And it was a massive shock, because it, it was shocking, you know? But, you know, within 36 hours, maybe 72 hours, it was my new normal. OK, I was only five, but kids are fantastically adaptable. I wonder what it would have been like had this have happened decades ago, where you couldn't talk to each other in the same way. I wonder, in some ways, social media is helping everyone get through it, and in other ways having so much contact and knowing what other people are up to, you, suddenly negativity breeds negativity, worry breeds neg uh, breeds worry, you know, all of a sudden you're all worrying about something that maybe isn't actually a thing. Yes, I think, I mean, certainly if you think about pre... If you think about, um, say, for example, the way my mother coped during the war and things like that, I had one older brother who was a small child during the war. My father was away, uh, obviously, fighting. And... Um, I think the way they all used to cope was community. The women really formed incredibly strong communities uh, with their children, helping each other out and talking to each other, and it gave them a lot of solace. But that's not social media. That's mm. a kind of... That's what we can't have, can we? We can't have, because of COVID and because of social distancing, we can't have that community around us. And I think that we would all be a lot happier if we could, but we can't. Yeah. I mean, that's the nature of this particular crisis. So we're yeah. stuck with social media. Now, I really like talking. I like talking to you and people like you on Zoom. It really lifts me out of this kind of sort of dead place you get in your head after many days of not sort of doing anything except reading or talking to each other or anything. But it's not the same. It's not the same as having you and your your children around or, or me and our grandchildren around. And it's very, I think social media is, is a very hollow substitute for proper physical community affection. But even mm. if we were allowed to, to, to mingle you know, at a safe distance, that whole thing at a safe distance, I mean, I, I've done a, a reasonable amount of kind of one-off telly over the last few months. And I have to say, I think television studios are probably the safest places to be these days. I mean, they are so COVID so aware, true. you know, I mean, they really, yeah. really are. And I'm sure you, you found that as well. But, you know, I've been on sort of quite, quite good, good humoured kind of game shows and panel shows. And that instinct to, to, hu to hug the, the person that you're playing with, to kind of, you know, punch fists, to put your arms around them, you you have to fight it because you, you simply can't do it. But it, it, it sucks away at quite a lot of the human joy of these experiences because you, you, you're constantly, you're withholding all the time. Almost as I hope the... that that doesn't become a long lasting effect. Like we don't have to second guess ourselves before we leap in. Because I'm, I'm someone who will literally first, like straight away, just go in for a hug. And I hope that that isn't one of those things where people are a bit jerky around it. I think we'll get back to normal once we're allowed to. Again, a bit like the going to school you know scenario i think will it will readapt in look because it's mm. it's far more natural to be physical with people and to kiss people and to put your arms around them and to shake hands it's far more natural to do that than what we're doing at the moment but we've mm. learned it now for a year and well, i don't think it's going to be that easy I, th I think people will be certainly over next winter i bet people are still wearing masks well, it's even so if even if the infection rate is low and the vaccines worked and all the rest of it mm -hmm. I think they'll still be... Ke I certainly sort of feel instinctively that I desperately want to see those that are close to me. Um, I'm not sure still about the idea of going to a huge uh, a cinema or, yeah. um, you know, a theatre or a massive... For example, last... Ja not this not not this just last January, but the January before, just before all this happened, we went to the National Television Awards ceremony, didn't we? That, that uh, was in the O2 Centre, mm, yeah. in the, you know, the, the Millennium Dome. Uh, and uh, it was there were thousands of people there. I would say easily yeah. ten thousand, weren't there? Yeah. Easily in the audience and the thing. And I think now, looking back, I think even though we knew nothing about COVID then, and we knew, knew nothing about distancing and all the rest of it, it was almost madness in a sense. It was hard to hear <laughs> each other. It was hard to see anyone. It's called um, a party. No, but it wasn't. And I actually, I didn't really enjoy it partly because it was so crowded. But I wonder if those kind of things... Did you... I mean, I'm sorry, I'm going off at a slight tangent here, but do you know that since COVID happened, there's been hardly any flu? No flu, no. Nobody has been catching flu because of social distancing yeah. and hand-washing and mask-wearing. They're all doing that. And I wonder, if you think about the risks we were all running 
at the O2 Centre yeah, last January. But there's a flip to that, and I read it yesterday, I read the same pieces that you read about there being virtually zero flu in the UK. I mean, it just hasn't happened this year, and it's not because of the vac- vaccinations, it's because, as Judy says, people aren't going to the Are offices, and aren't going to pubs, and not going yeah. to restaurants, and all of that, and, and social distancing, and washing their hands, and wearing masks, mm-hmm. and all that. But, the, but, but the, 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 the kickback against that is that we start to lose our, our, our natural immunity to flu if we don't get it. Um, and they're saying that if the flu comes back next year, and we're living life normally again, we might be a lot more susceptible to oh. it. You can't win. Can no, you? I know you can't. <laughs> oh, either way, there's death at the end. <laughs> there's always death. That's the one thing that we can rely on is death. Okay, but let's start with the beginnings first. Are there any similarities between your childhoods? So away from COVID, pre-COVID times, you two growing up, have you talked about how similar or different your upbringings were? Not much, but I would say they were very different yeah. because I was born. I'm a Mancunian. I was born in Manchester and a very, very, uh, you know, uh, working class Manchester, you know, uh, sort of... Don't you uh, mean working class? Didn't I say working class? No, you said class. Oh, shit. (laughs) (laughs) All these years together and it still still works. (laughs) (laughs) No, I was born in literally... Well, I wasn't born in it, but I I grew up in a two up, two down, you know, no bathroom, no to- toilets in the backyard, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it was a very, very uh, working class child, which basically I got out of because I had an incredibly bright and upward sort of, if you like, aspirational parents, especially my mother, who was determined that me and my two brothers were going to do very well at school. And we did, all, all three of us, and, and, and we won scholarships, et cetera, et cetera, because my mum push- pushed us. And we were literally the first children in our generation, in our family ever, the first generation of children to go to university, which we all did. Um, but mine was a really basic childhood. Yours was, I think, more... Mine's a bit but lighter, wasn't it? Yours is quite easy to describe, actually, and sort of, you know, dock it. M- mine was, was much, much stranger, really. But, I mean, I, I'd say I had a... You had a... You had a, a a class background, and I had a classless background. I mean, my mum was Canadian. Uh, my dad had met her when he emigrated to Canada after the war, and after a few years, brought her back. and And we lived in uh, in Romford, which is now classed as East London, but then was slightly, slightly still a bit rural Essex with Romford Market with sheep and cattle and stuff. Dad was Dad was an ex public school boy, but he was a farmer's son. But he was a journalist. Uh, he he he'd, he'd, uh, once he'd done his national service in the RAF. He uh, he was a reporter for newspapers in this country, then Canada, and then he was working in PR. And I always think, um, I speak as a journalist myself, I think that journalism is quite a classless profession. Um, mm. you, you can work in journalism wherever you come from. You know, it, it's, it's, it's not defined by class or background at all. It's just not like that. Certainly not in this country. Um, and mum being Canadian, I, I, and, and living in what is now seen as East London, um, I felt I, I could have a foot in almost any, any camp. I mean, when I was at school, I spoke like that because, mm. like, you know, I was an Essex boy and I really did talk like that. That's how I spoke. But when I got home, my, my dad, who was public, public school educated, would insist that I, I sound my H's and didn't drop them, you know, and said my NG's and didn't drop the G. And so I spoke kind of like this. So I was, I was like this at home. I was like that at school in the playground. Um, and um, I, I was never quite sure who I was in, in, term, in terms of class background. And actually, I was quite happy not to be categorised. So, no, we, we had very different upbringings, I think. And uh, how did you two meet? Huh. Rubik's Cube. Uh- well, at work, actually, we didn't meet through you. I'd be, we did. Oh, God, not again. <laughs> oh, very, a bit, I'll, oh, I'll do the Rubik's bit and then she'll do the, the work bit. Do a very bit. small bit. All right, Judy was a reporter presenter at Granada Television on the uh, west side of the Pennines. I, at the time, was doing the same job for Yorkshire Television on the other side of the Pennines. And I'd been there for a couple of years. And uh, one day I, I, I got drunk one evening and I was late to the news conference the next morning so I got the fag end of the stories and I was sent up to York University to do a, a two minute piece on, a, on an international conference on the mathematics of Rubik's Cube I mean great story right um, so I did my best with it and I finished doing a little piece of camera holding up a Rubik's Cube and it's the old reporter's gag when you're doing the, the Rubik's Cube story you have one that's completely discombobulated that you hold to camera and you, you drop it down as you're doing your piece to camera and you pick up one that's been made up you know with all the colours yeah. on the, and you bring that back into shot about a second later uh, as if by magic and and, you know, the punchline is something like, oh, I'm all fingers and thumbs today. That took me five seconds, you know. Ha ha. And I, anyway, I sent this down the line and ITN picked it up. They liked it and they showed it that night on News at 10. And the guy who ran Judy's newsroom, a guy called Rod Caird, was watching News at 10 in his bath that night, saw me do the piece to camera and thought, I think that's the right guy to put with Judy Finnegan and Tony Wilson, who was also presenting on the show. And I got a phone call the next day and they offered me the job. 
and I went across. And that we met in the newsroom, didn't we? Yeah. I bet you don't even remember what a Rubik's Cube is. Of course you don't. Oh, we've got, we've got them, oh, honestly. And we actually, yeah, Rubik's Cube we in. used a Rubik's Cube in um, a book that me and Tom wrote together. It's a really important piece in the book, actually. Well, the point oh, I, really? The, well, the I point, very quickly, the point of that story is, really, the reason I tell it is, it just shows that life turns on a dime. That, yeah. that, that, that one's fate absolutely rests on infinitesimally small detail. So if I hadn't got drunk the night before, I would have been in on time and I wouldn't have done that story, but I did do the story, but if I hadn't done the Rubik's Cube thing and if that guy hadn't been watching, blah, 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 we would, I wouldn't be a grandparent of three lovely grandchildren. I wouldn't have Jack and Chloe and be stepfather to Tom and Dan. It's all because of Rubik's Cube. That's, yeah. the, sto- that's the reason I tell it. Yeah. It's also because I sort of went along with it. I mean, I, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't like kind of a magic wand from the Uber Rubik's Cube. No, but if it hadn't happened, we... I'd, I'd have probably gone to London. Anyway, go on, you, you say what happened in the newsroom. Well, no, I mean, he was just, he was uh, a, a newbie, a, a new boy in the newsroom. Um, and um, we had a, it's quite... We had a scheme in the in the newsroom in those days in 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 Manchester at Granada in Key Street, where if anybody new joined, um, somebody would be uh, his kind of mother or father. Somebody was appointed to be the person who showed that person all the ropes and uh, where the loo is and uh, you know who's who and all the rest of it, just for a, a few days when they start. And I was for some reason appointed to be. His mother, <laughs> which is really <laughs> so, I, which is a bit of a strange. I had to go up to him on his first day in the newsroom, and I remember you you had your back to me, and I sort of tapped you on the shoulder, and I said, "Hello, I'm your." You didn't. Ta- I'll tell you exactly I, what you um... did. I was I was facing. I was. It would have been my laptop, but of course it was a typewriter. Then I was facing the typewriter, and I was busy typing my first story, and I felt two hands on my shoulder like that, and this voice said, "I'm your mummy." <laughs> It sounds a bit kinky in retrospect. It was just meant, <laughs> it was just meant to break the ice, and that's literally how we met. But we were working together after that as well. We yeah. worked on the same program, which was the local, um, like BBC London is now or um, ITV London. Uh, we were in the local Granada Report studio, which covered the whole of the northwest. Um, for uh, as a news program, we we're both. I mean. I'd never been in papers. Richard started off in papers when he was about 16. I hadn't. I'd come from university and sort of uh, got into television and basically as a runner and a researcher um, and then got became uh, a reporter and news presenter. So that's how we met. We worked, for a lo- we worked together for a long time before we realised there was anything going on. A good year. So how did things leap from friends to being romantically linked? Well, they never did. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a complete professional sham. This thing. <laughs> <laughs> we live in separate houses, actually. No, go on. No, what <laughs> happened was um, after, um, after we, as well, yeah, it was. We'd been working together for about a year, and we had to. In those days, I don't know if you've ever seen. Are they still going? The Blackpool lights. Every oh, gotcha. the black the light the illuminations in Blackpool. Yeah. They um, every um, uh, autumn. Uh, they, they sort of switch on in September to sort of extend the summer season to get visitors down to look at uh, to look at the lights. And I, I grew up with them. Obviously, I was born in Manchester, so uh, with my parents, it was a yearly thing um, mm. to go and see the lights, and it was a huge treat. Uh, I loved it. Um, and when we were covering, when we were in in, in doing the Granada Reports news program, uh, the, in those days we took a few weeks off the off air for summer. Um, and then we would come back in the autumn and our, our autumn uh, relaunch would coincide with the Blackpool lights. So they sent us, me and Richard, to Blackpool to make a short film promotion, basically, uh, for our programme, but also against the background of the back- Blackpool lights, which was great fun. And that's the first time we'd really worked properly together as a film away from studio, wasn't it? Yeah, and it was it? quite intense, wasn't it? It was an intense day of filming. Yeah, it was, yeah. A, yeah, it was quite strong. And then afterwards, the, the, the film crew went off to do something else, some other story they were working on. So we were kind of left on our own, and we had we had dinner together, didn't we, in yeah, Blackpool? Dinner. Yeah, so, and, then, and then we got a black cab all the way back to Manchester. Yeah, back to Manchester, and we sort of talked and talked and talked and talked, and it it just kind of got mm, we just got beyond all the professional stuff and got to really know each other, you know. And I suppose that's when you kind of that's when we both thought it was like a first date, wasn't it? Yeah, well, yeah, a very uh, unconscious first date. That's, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And that was it. That started yeah, things. Yeah, an exchange sort of, of pheromones and, you know. Yeah, we sort of knew something was odd then. It still took quite a long time to resolve. Well, yeah, we I knew... had two children. Hmm. Um, well, was that a big thing as well? Because obviously you, you knew that meeting someone, I would imagine, would be letting Richard into their lives as well. 
Absolutely. A huge deal. It was a major thing for me. I mean, my marriage was... Uh, but, had, had failed, um, as, as indeed had yours, but Richard, you had no children, so there mm. were no complicating factors in that case. But for me, my boys, who were about seven then, and my two little boys, they're twins, and they, um, to me, their happiness was absolutely everything. And I mm. I couldn't possibly dream, um, whatever I felt about him, and, and, and clearly, I, you know, I had fallen in love and all the rest of it, and I wanted to spend the rest of my life with you, but I couldn't do that unless I knew absolutely sure in here that that was okay for the boys and that he was the right person to bring them and that he wouldn't sort of regret it because, you know, he, he's, he's, he's eight years younger than me. So the idea of taking... and I, I was, what, mid-30s? You were late 20s. Mm -hmm. And the idea of a young man in his late 20s taking on two little boys from somebody else was a, a huge deal and I had to be sure that it was all right and so it, that's why it took much longer it than was, it probably would have done to, to, to work out. But it was never it was never the elephant in the room I remember when Judy and I after you know that initial sort of first date what do you want to call it a few weeks and months had gone by and it was quite obvious that we'd fallen in love and we wanted to be together but there was this very important question of of the boys and I remember Judy saying she put it very well she said to me when we were having our first proper conversation about living together getting maybe even getting married maybe having more kids all of that stuff um she said to me yes but you've got to understand from the off I come in a three pack which was a really good way of putting it. And I, and I have to say, I got it. I mean, I, I wasn't sort of in denial about it. I didn't think that she was being overcautious or fussy. I, I agreed with her that it was really yeah. important. Not just that the boys liked me, but I liked them, you know. Um, it, 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 had, it had to work but both ways. So we took it very slowly, for their sake, really, probably a lot more slowly than we would have done if, if Judy hadn't been a mother at that stage and they hadn't been that age, you know, at seven. And then we had a little experiment. We, um, it, that would have been in the, these conversations would have been happening in the early spring. And then that August, we rented a cottage down in Cornwall, which was the beginning of our love affair with Cornwall. And the four of us went down there. Uh, because we thought if I was going to move in, it would be a bit odd for the boys, who by then knew me pretty well. You know, I was yeah. a regular visitor to the house. We used to go out, you know, en famille together and stuff. It would be suddenly a bit odd if one morning I was at the breakfast table, you know, hello. Mm. So we thought we, we'd, we, we'd established that that, you know, like sleepover thing um, in neut on neutral territory. So we rented this beautiful little cottage uh, down in southeast Cornwall and we went down there in 1984. Four. On oh, the, yeah, was it four? It was four, yeah. Mm -hmm. and it, on the most perfect week of English summer weather, there wasn't a cloud in the sky, this gin clear skies all week. We had the most amazing weather. And we, we stayed in this cottage together. And it, and it, was, a, it was a big hit and it, it was obvious that it was going to work. And we drove home after a week. And I remember pulling up in the drive of the house that Judy lived in. And I helped everybody in with the bags and everything. And then by arrangement, Judy turned to the boys and said, it was about five in the evening, she said, um, well, are, you, are you OK with Richard staying here tonight, boys? And with, without missing a beat, they went, well, oh, yeah. <laughs> and ran yeah. upstairs to, to have a bath. Um, and and that, that was it, really. Um, mm. it, 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 had, it had broken the ice and it had established that we you know, it would work. And what's interesting, I think, with the role of a step-parent is that so often in films it's seen as that evil person that comes into the family. And it's not given the... I think but people get step-parenting right. It's so amazing. Like, you, you, it's such an honour to be in those children's lives and to have that. But it's such a huge responsibility as well. Yes, and and you and you've got to tread very carefully, and and, mm. and 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 always take time. I mean, I'm I'm an, the agony uncle for the Daily Telegraph, and I have been for a couple of years now. I get a lot of letters about this, and um, because of my own experience, I'm very comfortable uh, replying to them and giving advice. And what I always say is, because um, very often I get letters from from either the, the, the man or the woman, the the, the 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 father or the mother, who who are talking about tensions and and, and these issues and difficulties, and, and they want to know what to do. And I always say to them, if you put the children first in everything you do in this period, if you always put them first and think, how will this affect them and how can I mitigate that or make it, make it good? If you do that all the time, you will not go wrong. Mm. It, if you attempt to ignore their needs and attempt to kind of push it to one side and pursue the love and the romance of, of, of the adult part of the relationship, you'll come unstuck. Uh, it, it'll go wrong. You've got to put the kids first. And actually, ultimately, that's in your interest, not just theirs. Um, that's that was the lesson I learned about step parenting. I think I mean he's been he has he's been a brilliant stepfather, um, quite extraordinary actually. And I think it's very hard. Um, I, I think possibly 
more hard if it's a stepmother, but I, I've no experience of that. But um, I do know that as a mother, I was watching him like a hawk, and that yeah. is not a romantic or loving thing to do because they were my priority. No matter how much I loved him, and I did, and I wanted to be with him, these two little boys were absolutely so central to my heart and my being that I couldn't have borne any kind of sadness in them or um, unhappiness or whatever. And so I was watching the first part of our relationship until I began to relax and take it for granted because I knew he could do it. I was watching him like a hawk. And I think that's quite difficult for a relationship. Um, we're lucky we got through it. And we got through yeah. it because he he was he was absolutely brilliant, still is, but he was absolutely brilliant. I certainly do not think that it's an easy task. Uh, and I think, it, but I do think if you get through it, when you get through onto the other side, as we have, it's very rewarding. Yes, and and, and all well. The other thing is, it's it's just about basic fairness. It's it's not the the children's fault that this that life above them, adult life, has has convulsed and turned into. It's not their fault. It didn't happen because of them. So you you have to you have to mitigate whatever the changes have taken place as best you can for their sake, because it's just not fair otherwise. You know, you 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 can't expect them to be the ones to carry the can home, really. And that's as simple. It's as simple as that. It's just basic fairness. Mm. And what was their reaction when you decided to get married? I can't well, we, remember. We decided to get married more or less straight away. Bef before, I mean, we were talking about yeah. getting married really... We within, got married as soon as we could. three really, weeks we? of yeah. getting out of the... Really? Got, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. We took... I mean, we we got married as soon as we could. We, um, we had... I mean, I, you were getting divorced and so was I. So we had to wait for all that legal stuff to be out of the way. Um... But we got married in 1986 and our sort of relationship had started in 1983 and become stronger and stronger. Mm. Uh, we would probably have got married in 84 if we could have done, but yeah. we, but we yeah. got married in 1986. Well, I'll tell you a funny story about our honeymoon. It was only three... When our, I have to say, when, oh. we, when our first child, Jack, was six months old, we had to wait. He was six months old. We would have married earlier, but we had to wait, for, as I say, for our divorces to come through and everything. Ah. So we, had, we went ahead because I was, I was in my mid-30s. Well, I was in my... By the time we got together, I was... I was in my sort of uh, beginning to be into edge into my late thirties, and I want I knew I wanted more children, and and so did you. So we we sort of went ahead and had Jack. Um, and we and we thought on our on our wedding day at Manchester Registry Office with just family, no friends, just just, just family there. We thought that uh, there were just the three kids there. There was Tom and Dan, <laughs> and Jack, who was uh, as you say, I think he's five months when we because we he, oh, he was, was born six in months. He was six, six months. Okay, we got married in November. So <laughs> we just had our three kids there, and the morning after the wedding day, we were having breakfast in this hotel, married now, you know, rings on fingers and all the rest of it. And I always remember saying to Judy, we both remember this. I said to her. Do you feel any different? Because we've been living together for two years by then. I said, "Do you actually feel any different now? We've both put a ring on it. You know, does it does it make do you feel in here any different?" And Judy said, "I actually woke up this morning feeling physically different. Um, I actually felt that I'd gone through some kind of physical change, almost like when I was pregnant with Jack." And we would later discover that Judy, in, in fact, was already pregnant with Chloe. So, so, Aww. so actually. <laughs> All four of them were at the, were at the wedding, which is great. <laughs> That's lovely. <laughs> yeah. Having done some reading, I, I read that you actually, you lost a child before Jack as well. So that was your first sort of experience of starting having your own children together. Yeah, and I lost the baby at uh, four months. Um, I went for a scan and uh, they just showed the baby's heart had stopped beating. And that was terrible. Just mm. really awful, you know, it just is. It's just really, really shocking, horrible thing to do. And I had to go into labour anyway. Um, and uh, it was it was just awful. When I got pregnant with Jack again, uh, I, it, was a, it, <laughs> it was a very traumatic pregnancy because you can't trust the next pregnancy at all. And I was, yeah, I was forever... which is interesting because with the twins, you wouldn't have had that experience at all. You would have gone through that pregnancy not overthinking things. I didn't even then... know I was having twins when, I mean, was, <laughs> things were so, I mean, Tom and Dan were born in Norwich. I was a reporter at the time for Anglia Television in Norwich and we were living there and um it was all pretty primitive, to be honest, in those days. They were born in 1977. And although there were, there were things like scans, I was just under my local GP. And he was a, a bloke who just used to put an ear trumpet to my tummy. That's all he did every single time. I mean, time. he missed another heartbeat, so... Uh, yeah. <laughs> he missed... He, he 
never heard of double heartbeat. He 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 just thought I was having one, and then at the, when I was about eight months pregnant, really at the end, um, I was sent to see some nurses. They prodded me around. They both looked at each other, these two elderly midwives, and said, mm, I think I can feel two heads. <laughs> and I was, that was pretty funny. What? So you thought you were having a two-headed baby? It never occurred to me. No <laughs> twins in the family. No <laughs> twins in, in, in either side of the family. Absolutely nothing. Complete and utter shock. So sort of, uh, yeah, all, all the, there was no technical stuff at all with, with, with Tom and Dan. It was really basic. So with... Uh, with Jack, yeah, I was forever having scans. Uh, I used to, every so often, you know, every couple of weeks, I'd think, oh, I can't feel him, I can't feel him. And I'd rush I'd rush to the Manchester um, MRI, and they were wonderful, weren't they? They, they were very patient They, 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 yeah, they got they so they expected me coming through the door <laughs> and, uh, and reassuring me. Uh, yeah. But, you know, so miscarriages are awful, but so many people have them, and I, I do think... It, you know, it's not the end of the world. And most women, I think the, the statistics are, I haven't got them to hand, but I do know that most women do go on to have um, a, another successful pregnancy. Yes. It's that thing when you're going through it, isn't it? It feels like a very lonely grief. And, and I imagine it, it's talked a lot more about now. And, and even from the man's perspective as well and his role within that and how you might have handled your grief and allowing to grieve something that isn't in your arms and isn't, you know, actually there with you. Yes, I th- I th- as, 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 the, as the father, as it were, as the man involved, I, I think it's very important to recognise that however it may affect you, it's going to affect the mother who's lost the child a lot more because, you know, she was carrying the child and, and she's gone through the experience of, 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 of either a, a miscarriage or an induced miscarriage because the baby's died in the womb. Um, and it has to be worse for her. I don't think there's absolute equivalence. I really don't. It was it was horrible for me. And and, what, and, and one of the worst things, apart from the, the, the you know, yes, the grief and, and and the shocking sort of disappointment of what had happened, um, is that when the next pregnancy comes along, of course, Judy's as tense as intense can be. But there's not much you can say as the father because it did go wrong last time, and it might go wrong this time. And maybe maybe there's a genetic issue between the two of you, which you're now discovering. You know, so there's. You do your best to, to be a comfort and a kind of a, you know, a strength, but there's a limit to what you can do. And thank God for scans, you know. I mean, you know, Judy would get herself into a, in a terrible state, you know, as the months rolled by. With Jack. But, with, with, with Jack. Uh, but then be at least be able to get in the car or me drive her, and, well, you were driving in those days, and go down to the MRI and get a scan to show that everything was OK. And then you pass a certain point in the pregnancy, and then even if things start to go wrong, it should be OK, the, the, the baby's viable. But I do remember this, actually. On the night that Jack, or the day that Jack was born, he was born just after one o'clock on a very, very hot May day. Um, Judy was sleeping, it was about 7.30, and I was um, standing next to her bed and next to the cot, and she was fast asleep, she'd been sedated a bit, because she'd had a cesarean. Um, and Alison Moyer was giving a concert at Trafford Park, and the MRI is probably about a mile from Trafford Park, and we were on about the sixth or seventh floor, and this beautiful voice of... of <laughs> I actually feel up remembering it. This... Beautiful voice of, of Alison Moyer kind of floated through the Manchester air, this warm spring air, and in, into the room. And, I, and whenever I hear Moyer singing now, I, 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 it just takes me back to looking at my sleeping wife to triumphantly deliver this baby after all this pain and, and, and stress. And there next to her in, in, in the cot, this beautiful little baby boy. And it was, uh, it was, apart from being a joy, it was such a relief after what had happened the year before. It was oh, such yeah. a relief, you know. We were there. It was going to be OK. Oh. And you talk about it as a family as well, because I, I read something where you said to Jack only a few years ago, if that hadn't have happened, you Jack wouldn't be here. No, absolutely. It's, no. it's what we were saying earlier. It's it's how life turns on a dime. You know, um, you you know, you backtrack through your life and you look at events and sequences, and and so much only happened because of the domino that fell before. You know, or didn't fall. It's it's and and and, and therefore yes, that's another. Um... It's another sort of gift of comfort you can offer to, to a woman who has had a miscarriage that, um, you know, these things, there are always in any life, uh, not just in terms of maternity and pregnancy and everything, but generally in life, there are often always things that go wrong, always things that don't work out, uh, huge disappointments and griefs, because, because that's life. But um, it doesn't mean, sometimes I read in the paper, very sad pieces about women who've had miscarriages and sort of feel like it's kind of always going to be the end of the world and they're never ever going to be um 
happy again. Um, but, you know, if, if, if you're as lucky to have as I was to have another one afterwards, um, then you look at them. And indeed, I look at Chloe, too, because she was a sort of accident and she was conceived only a few months after when Jack was only a few months old. Um, we wouldn't have those two kids. We'd have probably had two other kids and that would have been wonderful, too. But, you know, life is life and, and you have to accept the gifts it gives um, and, and, and try and overcome the awful things, really. Hmm. That's all hmm. we can do. And there comes a point where, as a parent where you've got to start saying goodbye and they start going off to uni this or is great. moving out. It's fantastic. Is it? <laughs> no, it's not. He always says that. No, it's not. I mean, it's kind of... It's, it is sad, but it happens in... I think if you're lucky, like we were, we have this big gap. So yeah. you, the, 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 the first two go off, um, but you've still got little ones around, you know, so so it kind of feels... That's true. It, it kind of weans you off yes, very, it, very slowly. it didn't end like that, you know. No. Um, yeah. And then when they do go to university, I mean, they when they're all at university, when, when the youngest ones were at university, they were always here. Well, <laughs> it's kind of, you know, they were always coming back and they were always... Were you with, doing their washing? or were they being good um well, some of that some of that but i mean no they just kind of they were just sort of around i don't remember a huge gap i don't remember well chloe was <laughs> chloe chloe came back after the first term she should oh watched. chloe she, dropped she, out she, she hated it she, she just she, you know me, really. university isn't for everybody i didn't go to university i left school at 16 chloe went to was it leeds she went to leeds university um and within one one semester she just knew that it wasn't for her she wanted to get into the real world and you know get earning and doing things so she came back and lived with us again <laughs> yeah and they still spend a lot of time here you know it's been kind of um it's nice they, they, they you know we're, we're sort of quite close and they, they and the worst thing is that uh our tom my tom lives in um in manchester so we haven't been able to see we, we managed to see him last summer didn't we in cornwall mm. when the restrictions were lifted yeah and we saw him and uh his his lovely wife davina and their uh our two little granddaughters in Cornwall then, which was lovely. But apart from that, we've not seen them at all. Except for um, Zoom. Except for Zoom, yeah. That, that's got, and, fam, and family WhatsApps are great, you know, to yeah. sort of uh, send pictures and stuff and chat. But, um, yeah, I mean, it feels to me, and this is just a perception, I'm sure it's probably not, not even true, but it feels to me like I see them all the time. Hmm. It feels to me like uh, in, the, in the years since they grew up and left and went to university and got jobs and everything, I still see an awful lot of them. Um, we're, we're quite sort of central for them, you know, so hmm. it's not as though we've kind of moved to... Uh, France or I and mean, we've, we've got a house in Cornwall but we, we we can't go there at the moment at all um and, and that's a nice meeting point for us all but also because we all live in London we're kind of we see quite a lot of each other anyway yeah but there must be a point as well I mean do you look back and kind of which bit is the hardest to parent hmm. I think that for me the hardest part it kind of it's parent and and, and everything else is the middle part when you're what? I mean, I don't know. You, Your kids are kind of... They're still... They're at school, but they're going through teenage things and they're sort of demanding, but in a different way. Mm. Um, and you're still worried about things like money. You're worried about security. You're still... Uh, you know, you've still got a mortgage to pay uh, and, you know, you're, you're, you're worried about that. I think women, I think mothers particularly, are really programmed to worry. I'm a, I, I'm a complete worry wart even now, even though I, I probably shouldn't be. That to me was the hardest. I also think, I think when they're, funnily enough, when they get older and they go to, they start going to university, you start wondering about what kind of jobs they're going to do and what what's going to happen to them in later life you desperately want them to be happy more than anything else you never forget i mean that old that old saying wherever it came from you're only ever as happy as your uh, unhappiest child so yeah. if one of your children if you've got four that you know that they're not even i mean one of them will be up one of them will be down more whatever and if one of them is is not happy in their job or their relationship or whatever uh, you never stop feeling that it doesn't matter if they're in their thirties, you never, you, 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 you still. So I think that's that's quite hard, isn't it? Yes, I mean I wouldn't disagree. Launch, launching wouldn't, them off. I wouldn't disagree with any of that, but maybe speaking as a man, I'd say I'd say that the hardest period is when they're babies. You know, I mean <laughs> they they absolutely need you virtually to breathe for them. Um, and it, I, I found that I, I I'm not saying I didn't enjoy it. I did. It was very a very sweet time, and I look back on it and I look back at the photographs. You know, with huge tenderness, but it's bloody tiring. 
Mm. And it's full on. I mean, you, you know that. It is absolutely full on. And I certainly, for me, I found that, if you, you know, to answer your question, for me, that was the most difficult. Emotionally, I think I'm able to detach a bit more than you are. Yeah, you are. Um, because I think, you know, everybody goes through ups and downs in life and your kids are, are, are part of that. And, 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 you know, most of us get through it. And we've never had cause to really worry about them, you know, yeah. on an emotional or practical level. Be concerned about them and, and be sympathetic for, you know, the sort of vicissitudes of life that they're going through. But I, I, I've never seriously worried about my kids as they were growing up and, and now they are grown up. I think they're all fine and I think they're all quite self-sufficient. I'm quite proud of them. But in terms of, of, of me, I, I just found the first two or three years, I mean, exhausting. I mean, Jack, for example, when he was little... He was a little bugger. Um, I mean, he was he was he was very sweet and he was good fun, but he was really difficult uh, as a toddler. He was you know talking about the you know the, the terrible twos and everything. And he he had a thing, and, and and Jack was very strong-willed and still is. He had a thing as as they were sort of going through their you know like three four five years old that he hated going out to eat somewhere. He just hated it. Most kids love it, but he hated it. So if we wanted to have, back in Manchester, have you know, go out into the Lancashire Hills and have a lovely Sunday lunch with Julie's mother and stuff, Jack would kick off all hell when we said at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, all right, get dressed, Jack, we're going out for lunch. He'd go mad. He'd have a real tantrum and it would go on and on and on. He'd carry on in the car and then we'd get to the restaurant and it would carry on in the restaurant and he'd sit there, you know, maybe four or five years old and he was kicking under the table with his shoes and shouting and throwing things. And the only way to, everybody has their sanctions with kids, and the only way to get to bring Jack to heel when he was being like this was to threaten to take him back to the car. Um, what you'd do is, you'd, you know, it would be me, I'd say, right, that's it, Jack, you had enough warnings, and you'd pick him up, put him over your shoulder, and put him in the car. And on this occasion... You wouldn't leave him. He wouldn't, oh, wouldn't yeah. leave him, no, no, no. no. <laughs> but on the, but he, hate, he really hated that. He hated being isolated like that and taken away from the group, and that would usually calm him down. Anyway, on this particular occasion, we were at the... Um, in at Whitewall, was it? Mm, in, in, in the Forest of Bowling. Fantastic, yeah. like, beautiful hotel restaurant in the Forest of Bowling, having Sunday lunch. Jack was really playing up. And it, you could see it was annoying all the other tables, this screaming, kicking, yelling toddler, you know. They were looking across through narrowed eyes and all the rest of it. And I gave him three warnings, and finally said, right, that's it, Jack. The car. And I went across, took him out of his high chair, put him over my shoulder, and I could see the relief on everyone's faces. You know, <laughs> oh, thank God he's taking the little shit out, you know. And I'm kind of weaving my way through all these tables and these families having their Yorkshire puddings and roast beef and stuff. Excuse me, excuse me. And they're like smiling, and thank God. And I'm just about to exit the dining room, and Jack's facing the room behind me because he's over my shoulder like this, like a sack of coal. And I suddenly felt him stiffen. And I realised he'd stretched his arms out towards everybody, and then he shouted at the top of his voice, he said, Help! Help! <laughs> well, I thought, what? And I looked at him, but he looked back at them with this total actor's expression on. He was acting, right? He went, not the car, Daddy. Not the car. <laughs> right? and, I, and everybody's faces changed like that, and I realised they were thinking, what's he going to do to this kid? Is he going to tie him to the bumper and drive off? You know, what's going on? Anyway, I took him outside, and the moment we got outside, he burst out laughing. He knew what he'd done. He knew he, he was cackling. He knew what he'd done. Anyway, it all worked out. I put him in his car seat, you know, belted him in, shut the door, and I, I just lean against the bonnet and have a fag, you know, for five minutes. Yeah. He'd calm down, take him out, and then he was always as good as gold after that. But I'll never forget that. Help! Help! <laughs> Not the car! <laughs> How does being grandparents compare to being parents? Because it's a whole different kettle of fish. You're not trying to juggle so much. Your responsibility is different. Yeah, it's great being a grandparent. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you. It feels a bit, bit of a fraud, really, doesn't it? I mean, you, hmm. you kind of these gorgeous little things come round, and but you, as you say, you don't have, you don't have the ultimate responsibility. Um, all you want to do is play with them. Really, you don't have to yeah. do sort of do any of the kind of uh, parental or disciplinary stuff at all. It's like, it's funny, until you have grandchildren, as, you, as, as friends of yours become grandparents and whatnot, and you hear them talking about them and saying to you how wonderful it is, and up until having them yourself, I never quite got that. I thought, well, why is it so special? Surely having your own kids is, is, is much more powerful an experience. But they're absolutely right. And it's actually, it's a bit like... It's like living in the same house for quite a long time and then you come home one day and someone's put a lovely extension on at the back. A really nice extra room. Uh, and that's grandparentage. And you can go into that room any time you like. Um, and lock the door. And lock the door, yeah. <laughs> um, and also it's, it's so lovely building a relationship with them, you know. I mean, I, I had a... My grandfather was quite a withdrawn man. He was in the First World War. It, it scarred him physically and, and emotionally. But, but he was a very sensitive and intelligent guy. And, and he had difficulties in his relationships with, with everyone else, with his wife and with, with, with my father and my uncle. But 
that kind of skipped a generation and I had quite a close relationship with him. He was a farmer and I remember going for long walks with him in his fields in Shropshire, this beautiful farm that he had, and having quite, not intense, but conversations that I knew he wasn't having with anybody else. It was a, it was a kind of a special relationship. And I remember that really fondly. And I want that with, with, with my grandkids. You know, I want that with my grandson. They're all very little still, you know. They're, only one of them is properly talking at the moment. Um, but I really, what, I really what, like that. You have got an eight-year-old, you I know. just said only one of them is properly talking. Oh, I see. Well, yeah. they're both, they're both, they're, the other two I'm, are talking. Yeah, but you couldn't have a, you know... <laughs> <laughs> you know the colour... You'd be talking about, you know, CBeebies, wouldn't you? And sort of <laughs> Peppa Pig, you know. Um, so I can't wait for them to get a bit older, actually, and, and, and to develop that kind of more grown-up, you know, discourse with them. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, yeah. It's a bit... I, I, you, and you might, might feel this yourself, I think, because I think it's more of, again, I think it's more of a female thing. When you start having grandchildren, the first one comes along, it's, it's really kind of primitive. It's almost like a tribal thing. You sort of see yourself, you see your tribe increasing. And it's like one of those old biblical, what do you, may his, the boob and that, something, may his tribe increase. I don't know. Oh, I don't know. It's one of these old ancient sort of uh, poems. That m- might have been Longfellow, actually. But um, may, his, may your tribe increase. It is that kind of feeling. You feel yourself like at the head of a, a spreading out pool <laughs> of genes. It's quite interesting. Mm. It's very elementary. <laughs> I always think that when we go out with Tom's grandparents, when we used to, say it was their birthday, you know, looking around the room and seeing how everyone is there and they came from these two people in in effect you know there's these two people fell in love then they had three daughters then those three daughters met partners and then they had these children and now those children have partners and they made these children it's just all of a sudden how you've got 30 people in a room very quickly just from these two yeah exactly all and all certainly half of them uh, all with that blood running through their veins which is yeah. uh, it is an extraordinary thought it really is yeah. and it's uh, it's very warming i mean as you get older you kind of think really that's what it's all about really I recently wrote a, a series of letters around motherhood, um, some to the kids, some to Tom, some to different body parts, some to strangers. If you two could, both of you separately, could write a letter on being a parent, who would it be to and what would you say? I don't know. It's because I, 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 my first thought is to my daughter and it would be, I hope, to tell her to be very kind to her kids, <laughs> not to worry because you spend all your life as a mother uh, worrying and when they let not to worry, to try and pitch yourself ahead and tell yourself that your worst worries will not happen. You know, your child will, because he eats nothing but fish fingers <laughs> when he's four, will not still be eating fish fingers when he's 24. <laughs> yeah. Kind of stuff. Don't worry, don't worry, don't get so anxious during your children's childhood that you uh, can't enjoy it. You can't enjoy the joy. Because looking back, it is a real joy. It really is. I couldn't put it better. I, I, I agree with every word she said. And yes, my, uh, me too, my letter would be to, to Chloe. Not, not because I wouldn't want to kind of, you know, support and inform and educate my sons about parenthood, but because I just think, goes back to what I was saying at the beginning of all this, I just think that if you are going to make a differential between fatherhood and motherhood, motherhood actually has the trump card every time. It's just that bit more important you know it's that little bit more essential and um uh, how can I put this I just think that that mothers need that bit more support you know um and and Chloe who's yet to yet to be a mother and we can't wait for it to happen uh, I think like all women um would would deserves uh that, that, that just that extra mile of, of thought and consideration and support you know they just do. I mean, you know, I don't know how you... Do. you know, I, I, we've just finished reading a, a book that we picked for our, our current book club. What's it called? Pull of the Stars. Mm. And it's set in Dublin in 1918 in a, in, a, in a combined maternity ward come pandemic ward. And it's where mothers who are very late on in pregnancy and are virtually about to give birth are sent because they've, they've caught the Spanish flu, which was the big pandemic back then. And it's set in real time over three days. And I absolutely loved it because it, it revealed to me really... <laughs> properly, not for the first time, but, but in huge, you know, bloody detail, what it's like to be a woman and pregnant in these latter stages, especially when things are, are going wrong. And men just don't have that experience. Uh, I think it's, a, it's an intimacy with your own body. Yeah. 
um, that you share with other women, especially midwives but it's a and hijacking, nurses and things. It's, it's a hijacking of your body as well. But you yeah. don't resent it. No, I didn't say you did, but it is a hijacking yeah. of the body. You, yeah. you are out of control. And mm. that is something which is completely outside the male experience. We're just, we just, we're just observers. And I'm sort of, I'd say lost in admiration, but that's silly because it's, it's the way it is. You know, it's, it's just the way that genetics and, and, and the difference between the sexes works on a physical level. But it's still something to be admired you know and sort of se- and not to celebrate it but um uh supported you know so yeah, yeah. My, my letter would be to chloe definitely not to me yes. oh i thought it was to to, to the kids oh, I, oh I wouldn't write to, i wouldn't write to you about parenthood you know well you, you can just you know tell about how wonderful motherhood is and women well, it's true. Are. well you know i think that come on <laughs> no. i finish every episode with you finishing three sentences they're very simple don't panic uh, being a parent means uh, basically never being able to put yourself first ever again <laughs> uh, never actually strictly being off duty and switching your phone off even now never hardly ever oh, no yeah no I mean you know you, you still get I mean one of our sons got covid uh the other, uh, the other, well, just after Christmas, and uh, with his wife, and uh, even though they were fine, they stayed at home. They, you know, obviously stayed at home and isolated, and they were fine. They got through it okay. You know, the daily phone calls to me were were essential, and you know, mm. I don't know. Yeah, you yeah. you never, you never switch yeah. that off. Since having children, I. <laughs> I've got very old. <laughs> 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 That's because they're fully fledged adults now with kids of their own. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'd just say I had an infinitely more interesting life than if I hadn't. And I'm happy when. Oh, well, that's the obvious one. Our kids are happy. I'm happy, yeah, and when and when the children are happy, but also I'm happy when they're all here. I still <laughs> feel I still feel that umbilical cord, you know, connecting to them all. And if they're all in the same room with me, preferably with the grandchildren too, that's when hmm. I'm really, really settled and really at home and happy. Yep. Well, I hope that day comes soon. Hopefully we'll all be back with our family soon. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Judy and Richard. That was such a lovely chat. Thank you. Well, we enjoyed talking enjoyed to you. It. it was really lovely. Thank you, Joe. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.